Uh, any questions in the room? Anybody want to start? Okay. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm glad to be here. I'm the ESF 11 coordinator for the state of Georgia. And so this is my first time joining you all. I'm very excited to, to learn more about your organization. So um, my question was with the Regional Emergency Response Network. I know you had listed four states. And I wanted you to uh, recap what those four states were and whether or not they were a governmental or nonprofit organization. Because I was just wondering, like, would we be able to request the services to come over? And because um, I helped do some of that coordination along with uh, Kim and previously Tina and Christine. So thank you. Great question. Um, actually, I know that that uh, response network was done through Lyricis. Am I right? D well, I was going to say, I know we've worked with New Jersey as part of it, and I didn't know. Um, is it Massachusetts? Is that, uh, Tennessee, Tennessee in Louisiana. That's correct. Yes, thank you. Um, so she may be able to answer more about whether to <laughs> or not. I'm sorry. The, the, the Regional Emergency Response Network, and yeah, sometimes it gets called RERN. We, I'm not an acronym fan, so when we named it, I didn't make the name be an acronym, so that's my fault. That's called RERN now. Um, the, idea, the idea of that was to try and get some conversation happening on a really, again, that local level. And we went through the state library organizations in those four states and talked about where, where could lyricist preservation help or where would the most impact be within those given states. So for a couple of the states, it, was, it truly was a statewide offering. In two of the, uh, at least I, I know in New Jersey, it was just one couple counties in New Jersey, so very localized. Um, in terms of whether it's, it's it, there are no, you asked about government agencies, there are no, there were no, uh, unless the state library participated. In some cases it was libraries and archives. We had, a, I think, a couple of historical societies involvement. Um, this is truly not as, even as formal, I think, as, as the HERA groups, or as HERA or SHARE or some of the other Alliance for Response groups. This is still really in its infancy <laughs> in terms of how each state decided to go. Uh, we created a, s a set of training materials that's, uh, that are available for people to use. Um, sorry, excuse me. Uh, we've also, I I'm still functioning as a resource person. In terms of adding more states to it, our grant funding was for a two-year project for four states. So at this point, there is no plan to make that bigger unless we go forward with grant funds. But that doesn't mean that I, that I, as the preservation librarian at Lyricist and Lyricist as an organization, wouldn't be more than willing to share that, those resources. I can certainly give you the contact information for the different states, if that would help. But in terms of it being a, f um, a, a real formal kind of group that some of the Alliance for Response have become, we're not there yet. The reason I know about New Jersey is because we've worked with them so much based on Katrina and Hurricane Sandy. So that's why we've, the listserv's just been going crazy <laughs> between those two events. So, Hi, um, Ann Frosson. As a representative of HERA, um, I was interested in talking to Mona about your cache of emergency supplies. And can you talk a little bit about how you maintain that and your your agreements with the various institutions because we have one of those issues with HERA. Um, again, I apologize. <laughs> that is mainly a Delta regional uh, collaborative and I'm actually closer to Alabama. So they're on the other state side of the state. Um, I mentioned them just to kind of give us an example like what they're doing in that region. Um, I know that they um, maintain them at one of the institutions and I, I want to say that they at one point were talking about like transferring them around the state like every six months or so but um, I almost feel bad even mentioning because I don't have more information on that unfortunately but I definitely can get you in contact with the individuals who are involved in the organizations that wouldn't be a problem at all. The California Preservation Program has a website. California has an, an incredibly well-coordinated uh, site of 
where they have caches. And one of the issues was, you know, how, how do we store them? They, they didn't want to store them necessarily at institutions where if they were affected, they wouldn't be able to access the, the stuff. So they, um, one of the networks in California, I can't remember which one, has, and it could be more than one, has a supply cache in a cargo, you know, container, a shipping container that was donated by waste management. So I'd say hit up your, um, some of your corporations that you might know who might be willing to have their name on something and it's great PR. So that's a great way. And they actually had one of their, one of their meetings was at the supply cash location. You know, they had coffee there and then they, sh they walked people through the shipping container and said, this is how, you know, this is where the stuff is, is, um, resides. This is, these are the procedures on how you access it and how you replenish supplies and how you get to it and this is the combination to the lock, so. The Alliance for Response in Pittsburgh, and I think some people are online from that. Um, Miriam, I'm gonna give your name to Anne Frelson to talk about this. Um, the Alliance for Response in Pittsburgh, that's one of the things they're working on right now. So I will get you her contact information and she might find you anyway. So Miriam, it's gonna happen. Any other questions? Nope, you guys are so quiet. Okay, well I have a question um, for anybody in the room, anybody online and, and the panel certainly. The, it came up for a couple of the presentations you guys did about how many different media outlets there are, social media outlets. Um, when you've dealt with responses, what media outlets have been, when there's been a disaster, what was the media outlet that people have gone to or that you got the most response from or that have been most useful to you? Anybody? Well, as I said before, we re we've really had mixed results and it doesn't help to send a media release to oklahomaap.com. I mean, they, they won't, I mean, they have an, an email address, they might have a fax address, but those things just come and they don't necessarily pick them up. You don't know who's picking them up. And so one of the things that has to happen is you need to establish contacts uh, with people at your local media outlets. Um, take a media person out to lunch because, you know, there's a great story there on what you guys do, uh, but it's important to have that relationship because they're, otherwise, it's, it's going to a, a box, an inbox that might not be checked very often. Um, it's very difficult, you never know, it, but it's all about who you know for those media outlets. Also, if anybody has experience with like Twitter or Facebook or any sort of, if you've gotten any sort of feedback during events that way too, I'd like to know. Well, that's what I wanted to mention. Having attended some other workshops, I know with Sandy that the utilization of Facebook and Twitter and, you know, some of the guidance documents you all had for um, floods or fire, that that was a useful tool. And with the power being out, you know, that would, that's definitely an excellent, um, I know at the Department we, of Agriculture, <laughs> we do utilize Facebook and Twitter. So I just wanted to say that, you know, we've had successes there. State, State Department of Agriculture. People online are not asking questions. Any, okay. I'll ask another one. Um, you've also, everybody on the panel mentioned doing training activities and, and group activities. What's been your favorite or your most successful tool in, in, res in getting people to come to meetings or getting people to come back to you and say, that was helpful, I, I want to use this, I want to go forward. Anything that stands out for you? I think for the training that we received in Mississippi, a lot of um, the success can be attributed to the hands-on activities that we did. Um, you know, so often we will sit and, and learn these things in like a PowerPoint presentation, but until you actually are faced with it and have to get down and get dirty, you really aren't 100% sure how you're going to react or handle a situation. And I think having, I mean, or the responses that I received and comments that I heard from people were just 
how happy they were that they were able to actually do the hands-on activities and the group work together. Um, so that was really successful. And having two days of it, so, <laughs> so you know, you can't really do it in an hour. You know, you need to learn all the different, there's just a lot more to learn than what you can learn in an hour, so. I would say, um, as far as Hera, uh, one of our most successful and well-attended programs was actually on something that would sound very boring, but it was on insurance and appraisal. We had people that came from all over the state, and it was really an excellent um, class, very practical, and made people think about what happens immediately after in that response phase when you're dealing with these real issues of um, Valuing, val evaluating your damage, valuing collections, and working with, um, with insurance and recovery um, vendors as well. So that was a really good one. We also um, have brought in representatives from FEMA who did sort of an on-site review of, of the IC incident command system um, training program that they do online, and that was also very popular and well attended. So those were both great. I wanted to know how, this is mainly I guess for Lynn, um, how would you go about getting some of these smaller institutions like the little historical societies and the municipalities that have some of these valuable old collections interested involved and involved in disaster recovery? What would your suggestions be um, to people who are kind of outside of our field? that are more municipal governments or little courthouses, how would we go about getting the, bringing these people into the fold more? Yeah. Well, um, I could comment on that a little bit. I think that needs to be funneled through any existing um, infrastructure within the state, and typically that would be through state entities such as the state archives, state library. Um, one thing we learned after Katrina was how important those organizations were to building back the communities and how unprepared local governments were. Um, and so that's been, but also working through um, the, the local county um, emergency management as well. Anybody have any other? Yeah, I, w I was going to say as well, you know, um, GEMA has area coordinators as well. And so, um, you know, Sherry Russo is the one for the metropolitan area. But um, either your GEMA area coordinator or your county emergency manager, you know, you've heard reference to all day, you know, finding out who your local emergency manager is and plugging into that particular individual um, presidential policy directive number eight, you know, talks about working with the whole community in your emergency planning endeavors. And so um, they welcome that and can kind of check the box on that item. So they would be happy or um, should be helpful um, in, in trying to um, bring them together, just as a recommendation. Another thing I'd recommend is get out of the libraries and archives professional meetings and talk to people who are part of AASLH, American Association of State and Local History. Stop by and have a visit. I mean, there's a lot of historic sites and small historical societies that are open one afternoon a week. And it's going to take getting outside of your office. It's Maybe it's something you do when you're out running your own errands. I mean, it's I, I'm an advocate of not always working on your lunch. <laughs> you would like take your breaks and stuff, but sometimes to get to those contacts and find those people you don't know or that you don't know about your organization to, to walk in and have that conversation. Go into a local art gallery. If you, if next time there's a local art crawl in your community, walk in and say, did you know that there, have you ever heard of Hera? Have you ever heard of Cher? Have you ever heard of, you know, whatever. Drop off a business card and say, call me at your local convenience. I mean, there's, it, it and I'm not, I know I'm sounding sort of like a flipped tone of voice, and I don't mean to be, but I mean, it's, we get so used to our own channels of information that sometimes it is just to walk in and say, hi, I am, and this is what I do. And I'd love to talk to you some more. 
Yeah. I had something that I thought about while Mona was speaking because you are from a public library. Um, and I think that at least for Hera, I don't know that we have that many representatives that we've reached out to public libraries as much as we probably should because I think the public libraries are on the front lines a lot of times for the general public and for these smaller institutions as well. If they don't know, if, they've, if something has happened and they don't know how to respond to it or they don't know where who they can contact, I think that the public librarians are going to be the people that they contact first, either for help in finding those resources or as librarians. And what do I do with these books that have been written? So I think I had written that down as something for our steering committee later on, um, but I think that's a real, that's something that we really need to look into and um, make sure that we're reaching out to the public libraries as well, because I think they're a really good resource in contacting these smaller organizations and the public in general. Uh, this is more of a comment. Uh, the continuing and, and the $64 million question is really sustainability. Everyone is in it because of passion. And no one has this pretty much, or very few people have this in their job description. And so how do you prevent burnout? How do you keep this going? And, and um, while it's great to, to move forward without funding, um, at some point, if you want to make bigger strides faster, uh, funding is required. So um, there are grants through the federal, through FEMA, um, through the state emergency management agency called Hazard Mitigation Grant. There's a, they have a Hazard Mitigation Grant program. But um, that means you have to go, you have to work with your state emergency management agency to start writing this because it's, you have to work through them and, and obtain it. it you become essentially a sub-grantee of the state. So you need to, to have that uh, relationship established or start establishing that relationship so you can work towards having that happen. And I know um, Colorado has had one. Um, I, I work for Heritage Preservation in Washington, D.C., but I'm, I live in Massachusetts. And, and the uh, Emergency Management Network, Cultural Heritage Emergency Management Network, that esta was established in Massachusetts, um, we did write, it took um, three major revisions, but we did write a, a hazard mitigation grant program, which is enabling us to do a lot of education around the state. Um, and it's making a big difference. So that's one avenue to apply on a major level. Um, you might also consider seeking community foundation grants. And just because they might have turned you down a few years ago, especially during the recession, now's the time really to start saying, you know, to, to rekindle those relationships. And if you don't have a relationship, then it's time to start establishing those relationships because um, you can't just, your, the chances of your landing funding, if you just send in a proposal cold, are pretty nit, close to nil. So you need to connect with someone there and, and make a case for what it is that you do and why you need the funding. And because it is at the community, what you're doing at the local level is a, is you know falls in line with many community foundations. It's it's certainly worth exploring. One thing I want to ask, and I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm going to word this correctly. I've worked with a lot of different agencies that there are, there are gung-ho people who are really involved. Christine said she's been trying to slip away, but people keep sucking her back in. Um, so there's a lot of passionate individuals involved, but there's often, um, I, I often hear that, how do I get administration to buy in? Or how do I get support for my activities? How, how can, that's another way of, you know, how can we build this up? Do you guys have suggestions how to, how to, how to make this sales pitch to, to an administrator or to a board to say we should, we, we should formally acknowledge this as opposed to me taking my day off to go help? Um, one thing I would say from my experience moving from a public institution where it was part of my job and that was, it was understood to a private institution where it's not, but I'm getting the sense that it's very valued at my current institution because of, um, well, libraries want to collaborate, and this is a, you know, a major way that we can collaborate across institutions. And, um, but what's in it for us, we also potentially will have help and expertise brought in if we have a, an emergency locally. So I think you have to sell it sort of both ways. 
that it's good for the institution to be involved in collaborative activities, but also you get something back. So that so far, I think, is working at, um, within my new institution. That's private, so I wasn't sure how that was going to be taken. Um, yes, since I am at a public library, I think it's um, sort of understood. And so I guess maybe we're lucky in that way that, you know, first of all, we're actually required to go to so many workshops anyway. So that wasn't hard to make that case. <laughs> but um, they really do see it as a benefit to the library, not just to me to get trained, but it's going to eventually come back to them. So um, that really wasn't difficult, but I haven't, um, and that's really a trend within libraries in general, um, public libraries, I can say, that I've seen. Um, this is a shameless plug for another free resource on Heritage Preservation's website. We have a poster called um, Working with First Responders, Tips for Working with Them. So, so look at that poster, and there are reasons. It gives you reasons why you want to invite an emergency, a first responder to your institution before a disaster happens. And that, again, is something that you can tie to May Day. Um, making the case is all important, because if you don't have administrative buy-in, then you could be, you know, what you're doing is, is not recognized at all as valuable. So you need to get administrative buy-in, and this is the same case for disaster, you know, disaster plans. Um, if you don't have a disaster plan at your institution, you have to make the case on high first before you spend all the energy writing something yourself because a disaster plan should be a collaborative effort. Uh, so it's the same thing. You need to, you need to line things up. And I think part of what perhaps Hera can be doing is also to help uh, provide an, an elevator pitch. Um, so what you deliver is consistent. And it's short and sweet, and people have had a chance to uh, tear it apart and rebuild it. So the case is strong, because oftentimes you really, you know, if, you, if it doesn't go well when you're pitching it the first time, and you might not ever have a second opportunity to do that. I actually had another thought that's come up recently. Um, we never, as Hera, we didn't initially plan to have any sort of formal agreements that an institution would sign. But I guess from my perspective at the state, again, it was part of my job, so everybody understood. But now my perspective's changing a little bit, and I was thinking of maybe investigating that more. And it doesn't have to be a legally binding document, but it's more edu it's edu educating your administration if it has to go up the ranks and maybe your director actually has to sign off on your participation in this organization, there may be some benefit to that. So that's just a thought that's come up recently that maybe we'll consider offering as an option. And then you have institutional support outside of um, who within that institution is participating at the time. And if then there's staff turnover, you're starting over. Um, so maybe it would help with continuity and sustainability. The, the, there's a good example, um, again, California Preservation, the, it's the Ildren site, E-I-L-D-R-N, and they have a sample mutual aid agreement on their, on their site. And built into the mutual aid agreement is, is not only the commitment of the agency, they do have a small fee. Everybody who's part of it has to, has to pay into that fee. But built into the mutual agreement is that if you are going to be part of this, you ha someone from your agency has to go to meetings. Someone who's part of this agency has to contribute to the joint cash. But there's also an opt-out section. Built into this mutual agreement is, is a way to get out. And I, I've, I, when I've talked to people about mutual aid agreements or signing that agreement, there's this panic about, is this legally binding? Or, or you know, what if we can't? You know, what if we're the emergency and we suddenly don't have money? Built into that, to their sample, is, is an opt-out, which maybe might help sell it better. I, don't know. I forgot to plug <laughs> our membership drive, um, I think, strongly enough. If any of you here aren't members of HERA, please fill out uh, the membership form, which is out on the table before you leave. We would love to get that, and that way we can add you to the listserv so that you begin to get the communications. Um, so I want to encourage everybody to do that who hasn't already. And if you're out there online, that form um, is linked from our blog from the WordPress site that we had up on the slide. So please, um, or just send us your information, or 
Am I correct about that, Mandy? Okay. Mandy's our membership person. <laughs> yes, I was just going to follow that up with, if you are not a member and would like to be a member, please do that. If you are already a member and your email or your other contact information may have changed, um, please email us with that information. And you can do that um, either to me directly or to the hera.atlanta at gmail.com address. Um, because if your email has changed and we don't have any notification of that, well, there's no way to keep sending you the, the listserv or information. So either new members who want to sign up or people who are already members that um, may have had some contact information changes. That would be great. Also, while Alicia is moving across the room with the microphone, let me just say, I, at Lyricist, I'm also can feed into a preservation list that Lyricist has. So if there's any information you want to share, any questions you want to send out to a broader broader arena, we can certainly put those questions up there. If you haven't signed up for that, of course, I don't have the website handy. Um, there's a preservation listserv. Also, Lyricist has a Facebook page. Again, it's only as active as I am on there. So if there's, if there's announcements you guys want to have share with other people, I would be more than willing to do that. So don't forget, you can use Lyricist as a resource. I mean, we're, big, we're bigger than the Southeast. When it was from its older Solonet days, we're broader than Georgia, but that's okay. I mean, sharing what you guys are doing and sharing what people in the online areas are doing with the rest of the country, I would be glad to help facilitate that exchange as well. Well, the uh, topic kind of changed there, but can I also say, please like us on Facebook. <laughs> um, we do try to try to be active on there, but um, if you're already a member and you think you are, just check because uh, you know when we post stuff, it doesn't go out unless you have a certain amount of members. And certainly, if you don't like our post, then nobody sees it. So, um, I, if I could just encourage you all to not only join but also help us out by um, really boosting our post and it gets it out broader. Um, and can I also thank our sponsor, Polygon, for donating a door prize for anybody who becomes a member today. You are eligible to uh, receive a gift certificate and um, we'll do that drawing right after we're done today. But I wanted to thank them by name. Thank you. And thanks, thank Barry for coming and joining us today. What sort of, um, let me, then let me ask the group here, what sort of resources are you not finding or would you like to have? Um, we've pointed out some things from Heritage Preservation. Um, you guys have pointed out your websites. Lyricist has a, Lyricist Preservation has a fairly large website. I don't know how many people know it. Um, what sort of tools might help you? Um, what what documentation or, or what help? Is it sample elevator speech? Is it new copies of prep forms? I mean, what kind of things would help you in your efforts? Um, a couple years ago, and I don't know what project it was related to, um, and this may be linked somewhere in these uh, various sites, but the, there was um, FEMA training, uh, basically, that went through the basics of the incident command system and a way to sort of understand the uh, the nuances and how disaster response works on a macro level mm -hmm. so that if you're a small part of that or you're the site that is affected you understand the hierarchy of people that you're dealing with and it, I guess it's a language situation where you're dealing with local responders and state folks or federal folks um, I did take a few of those classes some years ago but I don't know um, the, the status of it, uh, if, if those are still available, where they're available, that sort of thing. The, the FEMA training, there's a website that FEMA has for training, and the initial, the initial series is still there. Uh, the ICS Incident Command System series is online. Um, it's self-paced, um, and then you can um, prove that you have taken it by taking a test. Um, I would encourage you to work with um, GEMA or whatever emergency management agency you're associated with to have that course taught live because it is, you know, 
ICS is primarily for first responders. Um, it really helps open up the eyes of both the first responders who might be in a class with you, um, and certainly the instructor's eyes about, wow, cultural resources that, you know, I didn't even think to consider that. And so you bring a completely different perspective to that, and it's so much more interesting talking to someone live than sitting in front of a computer, I have to say. So if you um, go online or just key in FEMA independent study, um, typically on the emergency management level to get plugged into the system, they like for you to now have taken um, ICS or IS 100, 200, 700, and 800. And um, I just wanted to mention that the Georgia Department of Agriculture, um, we do have a few slots available for the ICS 300 and 400. And that's when you're more in the command role as the ICS commander, or um, I like to say FLOP to remember it. It's finance, logistics, operations, planning. Um, <laughs> typically what you all would do would fall under the operations realm. Um, and so if you're interested in that, then please come and see me because we do have some slots available. Um, and I would also recommend that, uh, I thought I had 800 in order to serve at the State Operations Center. We kind of discussed this in an offline um, presentation. You now currently have to have 100, 200, 700, and 800. They do man mandate that, as well as going through the SOC awareness training. You have to have that as well. Um, but if you're gonna take the online courses, you know, either take notes or try to dedicate a slot because I got pulled away and trying to remember what you did. Try to, if you're going to do it, I would, you know, try to block off some time so you can get it done. Um, good luck. <laughs> There's also a book by David Carmichael, and the name I'm going to get completely wrong, but it was Implementing ICS at an Institutional Level. Or, and he took, he took some of the FEMA speak and put it into Cultural Heritage speak. So that also is a, is a helpful tool. And he did sample, use some of the ICS forms and filled them out on a sample basis. So that's another good tool to take a look at. Mona mentioned the need to have a disaster plan for your organization at the beginning of your talk. So I'm wondering if any of you has uh, recommendations of resources that an organization can use to develop that or if you know of a good template, or if there's some sort of collective. Why, yes, there is. Yeah. <laughs> so what would that be? There's the D-Plan. Um, you could probably just Google D-Plan, even. Yes, D-Plan.org. Okay, there you go, <laughs> D-Plan.org. Um, and that is a template. And um, we printed it off, actually, at my institution. And I think it's like maybe an inch thick. Um, and you can just fill it out. It's really helpful because a lot of the things that are on that form, I wouldn't have thought to include. So yeah, I would go with D-Plan. So I happen to have worked on D-Plan when I was at the Northeast Document Conservation Center. And we realized that for institutions after we had made this hugely comprehensive, because it's a plan that includes uh, prevention, preparedness, all response and recovery. And a revision is going to have to include mitigation now. Um, it was so comprehensive that very small organizations didn't have the wherewithal to complete everything. So it takes information that's very specific to your organization that you enter online and it marries it with boilerplate information and it spits out a disaster plan. So it's, it's really, it generates a printed plan. We found out that it was too hard for large, for small institutions to do. So we came up with D-Plan Lite, which is really just the, um, response to a, a disaster. And then as time permits, you can go back and fill in uh, the information about preparedness and prevention, and it will still keep the information. It'll populate both of them, essentially. Um, another great one, and I will pass this to uh, Christine is to talk about, is the PREP, uh, Pocket Response Plan. Yeah, the PREP is just a one-page a one um, pocket response plan. It's not your complete disaster plan, but it's a communications plan that you print out, fill out, print out, and keep in your wallet. And that's for the, you know, the initial people you need to contact 
in the first 12 to 24 hours of a disaster, and that was developed by COSA, the Council of State Archivists, and it's available um, from a download on their website. It's just a Word document, and you can actually download it and then customize it however you'd like. You can change all the text if you want to. And that's real useful. Also, when I was at the State Archives, we also developed a template disaster plan that's much smaller than D plan. Um, it was geared to uh, governments, but it's pretty general. So that is on the georgiaarchives.org um, webpage. That's just a Word document that you can download. There's a, one in Calif California. Preservation Association also has one, I believe. And I would also add not to have just one person have possession of the D plan or whatever plan you have, because what if that one person can't get to anybody? So have multiple copies, and so multiple people will know what to do. And on um, Lyricist's website, which I think it's kind of stable right now, I don't know if we're remodeling much. I think there are new menus. And there's, a, there's a website about preparedness and planning, and we've linked to a number of, of templates um, that, that exist. We've t we linked to a, a manual that was created by New York State. Um, it's, it's really a handbook. We've linked to the, the COSIS prep forms, and when that got modified, to, to not be at the, at the higher government level, to be more at a library level. And off the top of my head, I know we linked to D-Plan and a few others, and I'm sorry I'm blanking on what those are. Um, also, if you ever find any good templates or good examples, share with me. <laughs> I would like to, to link those so that other people can find them, because it can be hard to come up with examples. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to plug another heritage preservation initiative that I did is some free training through the uh, Connecting to Collections initiative. They have a whole webinar series on... Uh, disaster planning um, that just re I guess it was just earlier this year that that, that webinar series came out and it's it's there and it, it's really good it's very detailed it's maybe about three to five hours um, webinars so, yeah and, and I guess I should say because I work for Lyrissa that I actually teach a class on writing disaster plans <laughs> so I should say that too right I should have added that one in um, and in that class we also provide more templates and examples and have people read through things because, I mean, as Lori said, with, with just with D-Plan, not every, not every version fits everything you need. And, and so looking at multiple, multiple examples, and that's something about cultural heritage organizations is we like to share stuff so that R&D concept, it's really easy to do, too, if you were to search online, just look at public libraries, disaster plans, museums, disaster plans. They may have taken some of the key things out, like their security code numbers, that kind of thing, but they'll still share basic layouts. So that might, so that might help you get some examples, too. And another suggestion on the prevention side, if you're out talking to artists or some other different groups, is... Um, um, related to what she said, the continuity of operations plan or the continuity of government plan. And if you go to the FEMA Independent Study site, they have an online course for the COOP, they call it COOP planning. Um, or GEMA also has a classroom offering of that. But, you know, if they're prepared more so, it's less work for us on the back end. Um, I also want to introduce Molly Quinlan Hayes, who's in our audience, who um, is with South Arts, which developed an incredible tool for the arts community. So I want her to talk about it. Thanks, Lori. Um, I am with South Arts. We're a regional organization here in Atlanta, but um, Arts Ready, which I just happen to have some great material on, um, is a national initiative. and. Um, it really sprang from the work that we knew um, was going on in the um, museums and collections community and realizing that the rest of the art sector had no resources. Um, and so with the support of the National Endowment for the Arts and the Duke Foundation and the Mellon Foundation, we've developed artsready.org. It's a website um, and also an online readiness tool. So we're very much on the readiness, preparedness, business continuity end of the spectrum as opposed to response and recovery, um, but um, it actually uh, allows an organization to assess their readiness, runs them through a to-do list that is self-paced so that they can develop a plan, and it not, it's not just about written plans, but it's about policies and train, trainings and drills and procedures, um, and it also connects to a, what we call a battle buddy network 
FEMA calls it a mutual aid compact. We call it a battle buddy um, to find organizations both close to you, as Lori said, and far away. Um, and, uh, and also has cloud-based storage for critical information you would need in an emergency. Um, I will say that it does not have a depth of module for collections um, because, again, we started our first version, which launched in 2011, around um, arts organizations that present and produce programs. So it covers exhibits and facilities and people and IT and finances and insurance. Um, and we actually have been talking with the deep plan folks about um, connecting in some way to the collections management piece. Um, but it is, um, again, it's also I wanted to say it has a library. Talk about the R&D. The whole site was designed by the community and we've harvested resources and articles and templates and case studies. And they're in the artsready.org library, which is available and open to the public. Um, there is a small fee for joining to use the tool, but we have lots of partners who help subsidize it. So, um, yes, thank you. If you run into arts organizations and other cultural institutions, um, please let them know about Arts Ready. So, thank you, Lori. I just wanted to put a plug in for the IPER um, pocket response plan. That's what the lyricist. Um, Tyvek envelopes are out there on the table, those, those little envelopes. Um, it's a single page of information that really makes you think and about who has authority for doing what. And um, we at Emory did a plan for the Carlos Museum and then another for the library. And we got a, a museum intern to do the um, Carlos Museum plan. So it was a real good exercise for the intern to get to know the structure of a museum and um, where the collections were. The, I think the main thing that it, it does for you is it asks you where your priority collections are, which means you have to go to your curators or your collection specialists and ask those questions. And then they have to figure out what they can haul out of the building in 10 minutes. And, and I think that that kind of exercise not only makes them aware of disasters and what might happen, but makes them really have to think about um, how they prioritize and use the collection. So I think it has deeper fingers into your organization, and it's a, it's a really good exercise. It seems a little intimidating. Just keep plugging away at it and get several people involved, and I think it's worth it. And for the people who work in by themselves, archivists call them loan arrangers. I don't know what individual museum and librarians call themselves, but uh, consultants. Um, <laughs> but if you know, if if you are having trouble within your own institution finding someone to work with or to look at to look at the plan that you have so far or to help you talk this out, talk to your neighbors. I mean, it, if if you're just starting to get a disaster plan or starting to evaluate a template or, or what you think your procedures might be a sample policy, a sample elevator speech to make the pitch to your administrator. Reach out to your friends and neighbors who are also in the library field and who aren't. I mean, if you can explain the need to a disaster plan to someone who doesn't know what a disaster plan is, let alone what a library is, you can sell it to your administrator. So reach out to your neighbors, too, when you're putting this together. I mean, again, don't share the keys to the kingdom or the security codes or anything, but just the general ideas. Having that talk through exercise helps that way, too. We do have a comment from online, and it is um, for what you were just talking about. Um, for buy-in support for administrators, uh, Glenda Anderson had a really good uh, comment. She said, if you're going to public administrators, they're going to be able to save money when recovering after disaster by being prepared because they'll know where the, navig or the documentation is, they'll know how to contact FEMA, and they'll get reimbursed faster. It's a very good point. So that small business and working with the working with government agencies document that Heritage Preservation put together. That's a great a great resource to take a look with and get those ducks in a row before you know the flood happens at three a.m. Um, I'll, I'll just make a comment based on uh, what Ann uh, just. I'll just reference what she just said. I was down at uh, in Savannah with Shira recently, also uh, in a disaster response, and that's what I do for a living. Uh, which I've been doing for 30 years. So 
I've seen a lot of uh, emergencies, a lot of disasters, and I see them at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I uh, also was at Hurricane Sandy recently uh, for about two months. Uh, and and the, the photographs were great. Uh, we, uh, we did a lot of work in, in Sandy and Rockaway Island and New Jersey and uh, Delaware. So it was a, it was a regional disaster, uh, uh, and the magnitude uh, wasn't, uh, wasn't covered as well as it should have been, I thought. And, uh, but it was, a, it was a, on the scale of a, a Katrina, certainly. Uh, but more to the point of, about what Ann was talking about, just real briefly, once the emergency happens, you can't plan it then. So it's all about pre-planning in our business. Uh, certainly, we do that. We consult and we come out and this, as a service that we provide. However, all, all of the other agencies, I would advise, if you don't have a plan, get one as quickly as possible. Uh, I just recently visited a client uh, just, just, just this week, a new client. They called me yesterday with a water loss. Uh, fortunately, we had gone, gone in and done some pre-planning uh, just a few days before the event happens, and it's all about speed, and, uh, and that has the better result on the back end. Once, once you, if you've already been to the uh, location and you've done the evaluation with the administrator, um, it's, it's critical that you know just one, just two quick important things. Uh, one is what is the priority of the collection? What's your priority? What needs to go out in the first 10 minutes? That's exactly correct. Uh, the second thing is who authorizes that information? And if you don't have somebody to authorize you, go, well, who's going to sign off on something? Um, that can be, a, that can be a, a, a real problem when you're trying to uh, have a, res a quick resolution to an emergency loss. So just, just a couple of comments about that. Oh, while the, the, while the mic's moving, um, the COSTEP Massachusetts, the emergency network on, uh, for Massachusetts, recently uh, wrote a technical leaflet, I guess it would be called, on working with uh, recovery vendors. And we got input from uh, Polygon, BMS CAT, Belfour. Um, so it helps you understand the importance, underscores the importance of having that relationship established beforehand. But also if you're screening people, especially if you're, you're thinking about screening local people, making sure that they have the experience. There, there's just a handful, and I had just named them, of, of organizations, national organizations that have the experience and knowledge to deal with something as precious as your collections. So if you are working, for instance, at a public facility and you your state has an agreement with a franchise, you need to be able to make the case why you might want to go to someone with more experience. I mean, it becomes a bureaucratic thing, but certainly um, it doesn't cost anything to have, it shouldn't cost anything to have a representative from uh, a disaster recovery company come. They want to know what your collections consist of. They want to know how big it is. They want to know whether they need to bring a little van to shuttle the materials out to the, the giant rig because they can't get the giant rig to maneuver around the narrow streets that uh, are around your, your property. So having that information in advance, so when the call goes to Barry at 3 o'clock, he's not saying, excuse me, who are you? Because many times, I'm sure, you get calls that say, hi, you're in my emergency plan. You're in my disaster plan. Help. And you say, and you might be, <laughs> and who are you? So make that connection early. And they're your best friend in a big disaster. Uh, to your point, this actual loss happened on Thanksgiving Day, uh, and I did get a call from a third-tier person. It was actually a security personnel. We had just given them the documentation. That's exactly what they said. Uh, you're in our portfolio here. This is the first time I've called you. Uh, fortunately, I had already been to the building, and I knew exactly. I knew more than they knew about what was happening in their own response. So, and it is all about that uh, identifying and having your personnel know, because you may be gone, uh, to your point. Uh, and that happens all the time. The, the, the administrator of the protocol is not available. So some other person is now in charge. So that's a, that's a critical point also. And it does always happen. The chaos always happens on holidays, after hours, 
4 o'clock in the morning when nobody can be contacted. Uh, and send, and, but then we take over if, uh, if we've already done our pre-planning with you. And we can be that extension of your management for your personnel and, and to have a resolution of your very important documents. You know, and we take that responsibility also. I'm just piggybacking on the tool of the pocket response guide and, you know, I, I write plans and I update plans and you have to have a passion and love for that. But I'm also a huge proponent of developing the decision trees or the checklists because you have these plans, but everyone's not going to read them. And, you know, um, in my line of work, people having those checklists and posted in a visual, um, a highly vis visible place where people can see them, you know, has, has saved lives or you know, save property. So as you're developing your plans and updating your plans, think about having those, you know, the, the three-page version as well or, you know, developing a checklist. So I just wanted to mention that. And, and the point that you have to update it, just because it got written once doesn't, you know, people change jobs or you move a collection. And if the collection that you think is your key collection, it says in your disaster plan that it's on the fourth floor, but it's not anymore, you know, that's not going to help. So you have to, it's a document you need to update as personnel changes and situations change. And talking about the authority tree, I think um, Barry and Denise are right in that it always does happen on a weekend when all of those people who you designated in your plan are the authorities to make the decision, they're gone and you can't reach them on their cell phones. So um, it's really important to include people like the security members in your institution. You know, you don't always think about them. And talk to your facilities people, you know, the people who clean the building so that they know who you are and the importance, because they might be the first one in the building. Or the first one to find the problem. Right. Just piggybacking on that and partnering with your facilities, people, and your security. Unfortunately, at our institution, we've had several water emergencies, and it's always been that security and buildings people have um, uh, discovered it. And we've actually trained our security and buildings people on how to handle collections. Um, in our most recent one, uh, we had a whole gallery flood, so we had furniture floating in water um, and security. Um, found it and were actually trained on how to get artifacts out, how to get this stuff out. So I think it's really important, or, um, important to partner with departments at your institution because unfortunately, as the collections manager, I'm not the only one who's going to discover it. It's going to be our security people at 3 o'clock in the morning who happen to be checking and everything's floating in water. So um, it helps that they know, they're confident that, okay, I know how to handle this, I know who to call, I know where to move this stuff, et cetera. I just wanted to agree with that wholeheartedly because um, the picture that I showed of us doing the hands-on training, um, the individual that was in the center that I showed, he it was our facilities manager, and so he was getting training on that very thing for that very reason, so I agree. And anybody you designate in your disaster plans have two people back up? I realize that you know, some of you guys may work in agencies that have three people total. <laughs> um, but... I mean, it might be possible that someone finally takes the vacation to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, and let me tell you, there's no cell service down there. You're not going to get that phone call. You know, I mean, you just, you need to have, people need to know, and you need to give, provide alternative information, too. If you're the key contact, if someone, if you make the ultimate decision, you've got to give people a way to find you. Yeah. Um, I, I want to thank you guys for being here. I want to thank the people online for being here. Uh, this this got recorded, and uh, we will make it available, but how exactly yet? I'm not quite sure. Um, there Again, we I didn't get that far. Um, we'll get it out there to people available. The um, presentations we can make available if you guys are amenable. Um, also, the, any sort of questions you guys have, if you want to contact speakers, um, you can go through me at Lyricist, um, Alex Brentford at lyricist.org or just lyricist preservation, I can help you make contact with people. Um, and there are going to be um, some future town halls, and I will send that information out to people as they develop and sites get finalized. A and again, thank you for being here. Um, if you think of questions on your drive home or at 3 o'clock in the morning when you can't sleep, um, really, 
if you send us those questions, we can disseminate that out. So thanks for being here. I appreciate your participation. I appreciate you coming out and, and leaving your day jobs to be with us. Um, thanks a lot, everybody.